Simon Parnham and I did a, a missions trip last weekend to Paris. It's so hard. You can have that, actually. <laughs> wine and cheese all the time. Yeah, actually, they have wine with every meal except really breakfast. Did. Yeah, it was, it, was <laughs> it was our kind of place, wasn't it? Some people just need to suffer for the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we did, didn't we? Yeah, yeah and, no. and you helped me suffer. And, yeah, it was. And I helped you suffer. <laughs> so, so, so I'm just going to get a bit of a, a report on that. Yeah. Um, so, ooh, hello. Where do you want me? By the mouth, away from the mouth? Keep, keep talking. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, we went, and um, it was lovely. It was part of a church called CVV, um, which is Christ, the, the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life, yeah. Something like that, yeah, um, in French. And, uh, yeah, we um, were part of their weekend away, which was really lovely, very relational, very community. It wasn't like a um, sort of classic conference opportunity, so we got to eat lots of cheese and drink lots of wine with them, which was great. Um, And um, Andy spoke about four times or so. Um, I had the the privilege of speaking once to them as well. Um, And yeah, the the French are cool people um, and they have a really incredible spiritual heritage. Um, And um, as such, both of us really felt um, that it was about kind of honoring the French heritage as well and not just simply coming out with a sort of a British sort of style of Christianity as such. Um, And um, with that, we had some um, fun experiences with (laughs) good old Holy Spirit um, and um, confusing them as to why we were laughing so much at one point. Um, And uh, at one point, I kind of went to the front and had a, a word of knowledge for them Um, And it was just like, I mean, just to kind of demystify the whole word of knowledge thing. It's not that I all of a sudden have got a word of God or something like that. It really is just like, huh, my my neck feels a little bit stiff. I wonder if this is a thing. So you go to the front and you're just like, does anybody have a neck thing that they need prayer for? Um, And there was a few hands that went up. There was one lady um, who had had neck pain for six years, um, having fallen down um, steps. Um, and so we got them to pray for one another because, again, it's not us about people coming to visit. It's about what they have inside of themselves. Uh, and she was completely healed. Um, Yay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yay. I, I know we do healing testimonies quite often. Um, and it's one thing for me to say it to you. But when you look into the eyes of a lady who's had neck pain for six years, consistently so, um, the, the, like, you can get quite jaded with the healing stuff, but when it actually happens in front of you and you can see the heart impact that it has on the person you've just prayed for and they're starting to get watery-eyed and their husband next to them is just aghast and in awe of the fact that they're now no longer in pain. The next day that husband was healed as well of That's neck awesome. pain <laughs> that he had had for 12 years. Um, so a whole couple, was, uh, and they, they were beaming. Well, he was beaming and laughing because he was Italian, and she was just quiet and wasn't really sure what to make of the whole situation, but you could see just the... the yeah, no, she wasn't British, no. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Good uh, multicultural stereotypes. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so yeah, God did some really, really cool stuff. Um, and yeah, it was just really exciting, I think. Is that good? Yeah. Great, Simon. Simon actually did a brilliant word that I hope, well, we will get to hear here on, uh, from Malachi, which does translate in French to Malachi, more or less, which sounds like the Italian prophet Malachi, but that's what they, that's being cross-cultural for you right now um, and uh, about the heart God the ministry of anointing of Elijah turning hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers and it really kind of became a, a centerpiece for that we built around for the weekend and uh, he had some, some just brilliant insights in the role of of doubt in the journey to faith and I'm not going to try and speak it it's his message it, it was great and it enabled uh, 
me to sort of build on that and say, because it was a very young audience and able to just to talk about, here's some key things that our generation has received that this generation would do well to get because then you can build on what's coming for you. And uh, just as I was about to do that, he prayed for me and I got completely drunk in the Holy Spirit and, and couldn't, I was standing in like the lectern completely mangled for quite a long time, which seemed to be a sign and a wonder for the group. They were like, oh, look at this. This is sort of fun, fun to work, work together. Okay. We are actually going to do some teaching. You ready? Ready for that now? Fantastic. I'll find my notes. So we're doing a series called Hope Together, and we're kind of reinvigorating, relaunching, re-emphasizing our, our love and desire to do small group communities together, and, uh, and we just want to remind, stir up stuff about that, and uh, uh, there's some great things already happening around the small group communities and new ones coming, which is very, very exciting. And Jan, Jan McFarlane, who's away this weekend, is, is really driving that forward. She's actually away at Awakening Europe in Vienna, which is a massive evangelistic outreach. And then she's going with a friend on a, on a Holy Spirit tour of Europe, led by the Spirit. They're going to show up in European cities and pray for people and talk to anyone that God leads them to. This is Jan's holiday, so <laughs> let, let, let's pray for her. She's going with Nicola Kosica, those who know. She's going around doing that. So she's, her holiday is Awakening Europe, this massive evangelism event which she's serving at, and then she's going, led by the Spirit, on a train around Europe to pray for the sick and share the gospel. Sounds great to me. <laughs> so that, that's where she is. She's driving forward, helping coordinate this, this series and this emphasis. So I, I just felt in prayer just to start at this place, <clears throat> and, and then we're going to look in the Bible. We're going to go to Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 in a moment. So if you want to look up Ephesians 4, very familiar stuff to lots of us, but we're going to go there in a moment. Or I felt just, just in the prayer meeting this morning, just really felt that someone started to pray for me, and I just got this download or reminder about community and the origin of community. It's always good to see what we're here for is to see more of heaven fill the earth. We're, we're going to keep hoping till earth looks like heaven. And uh, so it, it's actually important to orientate ourselves to the nature of heaven because that's what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is reproducing here on the earth. And so if we, we're talking about things like small groups, where does that, is, will there be small groups in heaven, you may ask? And, 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 and uh, I, I honestly can't give you a complete answer to that. Other than this, <clears throat> I think the original small group is God. Yeah. All right, the original small group yeah. is God. Yeah. And, and if you just stay with me for a moment, because how, how many of you here we believe we are monotheists? So it's not a trick question, it's okay. If you think that's what we are, it's not wrong to believe that, all right? How many of you here believe we are Trinitarian? You're all right. You're all absolutely correct. We believe that, and we know. We don't just believe. We experience a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is one and he is three. He is three and he is one. And, and there's, no, there's no division between them, but they are unique persons of same type and manner functioning together. And before we existed, before anything existed, they existed, yeah? They, they, they are co-eternal. So the son, because he's a son, doesn't mean that he was born at any point. The only point he was born was when he came out of Mary's womb. Are you with me? The son is eternal. So that means that God's always been a father. He never became one. The son has always been a son. So Father has always been at the heartbeat of the universe, even before the universe. It's not a new idea. It's not something he became by having a son. It's something that he, he is and always has been. So you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we say this phrase often, don't we, which is in the Bible, that God is what? God is three in one. Yet yeah, God is love. God is love, that one? 
God is love. He doesn't just do love. He is love. His nature. It's a statement about his nature is that God is love. Yeah? We know that? And what do we know about love? We know that love, God's love, is that wonderful Greek word called agape. And agape is centered upon it's other people, isn't it? it it's, its focus is on other people. So I'd like to propose to you that the original small group was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they loved one another. They preferred one another. They built one another up. They encouraged one another. They had ultimate intimacy and ultimate unity. And Jesus in John 17 prays that we would be one as they are one. Whoo! And I'd like to propose to you that if, if God was only one, if he was singular, then he couldn't be love. You can't do agape on your own. You have to, there has to be an object of your affection, your love, your, your devotion, your service, everything that comes in that word. Do you see? So for God to be love, he needs to be more than singular. Trinity actually means God is love. Because the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, they all love the Holy Spirit. In fact, they so love the Holy Spirit that any sin can be forgiven, talks about, but, but both the Father and the Son are like, don't sin against the Holy Spirit. That's how much they're honoring and loving Holy Spirit. Do you, there's this mutual honoring, mutual loving, mutual preferring, mutual celebrating. That in fact, that the early church fathers used to call it something called perichoresis. It's like a dance. It's like a like a barn dance, like a like a like a Kaylee in heaven between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then one day they thought, this is so lovely and so passionately fun. We should bring some other people into the party. Let's make a planet, and then let's put you on it. Is this making sense? So, in a sense, we're the we're we're here because he's a community, and he's a community that is one. And when Jesus prayed for us, he was praying that we would find that level of community that he has would we would have. It's that level of fun, that level of love, that level of celebration, that level of connection. Good standard, eh? So, did you find Ephesians 4? Ephesians 4. So, what I just described to you is relational trinity. It's a relational trinity, and we're birthed by a relational God. Hence, we have relational instincts and desires. So... <clears throat> Let's just read this section together. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. I'm actually reading the NIV on purpose, but it, it's pretty similar in all translations. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Just kind of let that land in your spirit. The, the target, the goal, the level, the standard of maturity that the Holy Spirit wants to bring us to is that we look just like Jesus. And then we'll no longer be infants, verse 14, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning craftiness of people in their dread, deceitful scheming. Instead, this is the alternative to being blown around. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. Wow. The body of Christ is Christ, it's meant to become, to look fully like him. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Just say that last bit with me, as each part does its work. As each part does its work. So it's very important that 
the parts do their work, but it's very important that the parts are not monotheistic, i.e., doing your work on your own is not going to build the, the body. Um, and, and I just want to, by way of quickly remind you, if you don't know this, the New Testament refers to church in basically in three different levels. It talks about the church universal, which is when Jesus said, I will build my church in Matthew 16, he meant he would build his church, which was everything that has happened that is church, that he's birthed. So past, present, future, those that have gone to be with the Lord, those that are here and those will yet to be. That's the universal church. doesn't matter what brand, what flavor, what denomination. It, it, it's the body of Christ in that sense of universal church, okay? And Paul uses that, Jesus uses that phrase. And sometimes it gets confusing because he also uses the word church or ecclesia in the sense of what we've come to call local church, but that means a distinct body of believers in a place. So all the letters of Paul are written to churches that existed in cities, so to the church at Corinth, right. So the, the, the idea here is that this thing called the universal church is actually fleshed out in something called a local church. So it's not enough to go around saying, well, I'm part of the universal church and not be part of the local church because you've missed the point. You can't be connected to Christ mystically and forever and say, that's me in church. Actually, church is this. It's the mess, it's the joy, it's the struggle, it's the passion, it's the connection that is actual people in an actual place working out what this means, Okay? So I said there was three, didn't I? So there's local church in a, in a place, there's the, the church universal. But the third one that is surprising is church in the house or church in the home, which we'll talk on in a minute. And it is actually referred to a number of times and I'll, I'll, I'll refer that to you. So it's like it boils down again into some community size that's even smaller than a, a local church. Okay? And I'll show you that. We'll, we'll get to that. But I just wanted to sort of drop that in there. So back to Ephesians. <clears throat> verse 16, there's this idea that, uh, sorry, verse 15, that by speaking the truth in love, we're all going to grow and become, in every respect, the mature body of Jesus. And from him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. And it grows and builds itself up as each part does its work. So what, what's, what's, this, what's this saying? It's saying that the Amplified puts it, we're joined and held together by what every joint supplies. So at this moment, let's go to your body. Just have a look at it. It's beautiful, handsome. Well done. You've got it all here with you today. Did anybody leave their right leg in bed. This is not a word of knowledge, it's just a question. <laughs> I mean, there have been days when I've done exercise and I thought I'd like to leave my right leg in bed because it's not, it fancies a lie in and the rest of me is ready to go. Any, anybody ever felt that? No, you're all looking at me like that, never happens. So your right leg can feel like it wants to lie in, but get what? guess what? Your right leg's in church. Why? It's connected to you. By what? You're, you're on it today, Hannah. That was, I didn't primer or anything. It really good. What's it connected by? What connects it? Joints and ligaments. Yeah, yeah well done, Elijah. Joints and ligaments. It's kind of bones and all that kind of thing. Now, we're not going to get too technical here. That, that's enough for, for, our, for our level of... We're not, we're not trying to get first class honours degree in biology today, we're just, it's true, isn't it? It's very hard to leave parts of you behind unless there's a major trauma. Well, exactly. Unless someone sawed your leg off, there was a, there was a film about a guy who did that who got stuck with a, pen, with a blunt pen knife. Oh, I won't go there. <laughs> no, don't go there. I've lost the whole room now. <laughs> 
<laughs> and actually the reluctant right or left leg that came with you to church probably helped you to get here because it supplied something to the rest of you didn't it the ability to walk in the room stand up and worship so the, the connection is a place where life flows, where blood, literally blood flows, where energy flows, where, where function can happen because there is a connection and the connection is quite deep and profound. It's not something that can just fall off or be left behind by accident unless, unless you did that, which we won't go into anymore. <clears throat> there are children present. Oh, that was your idea. <laughs> so the idea is that this body that is joined, it's connected, and through those joints and connections, it, it's able to grow. It's able to build itself up. So c connection is really, really important, and it's important to find and hold on to connection because that's where life is going to come from. Even if your leg fancies a lie in and the rest of the body's not having one, sorry, leg, you've got to be there. Does that make sense? If it's a body, if it's a collection of Lego bricks, then no, it's not the same thing. But this is a body that is, that is joined that Paul is talking about. So... <coughs> We really, and we really need the nutrients. If I disconnect, my, my leg may be all for having a lie-in, but if I disconnect it from the rest of me, guess what? That leg's going to die pretty fast. And the rest of me will feel the lack of, but actually we'll still be alive. We'll be hopping around for Jesus. And so these flow of nutrients are not optional. They're actually essential that, that we find a way to connect to the body of Christ in a way that we can both give and receive the nutrients we need. It, it, yes, it does come from Jesus to you, but it, often it comes from Jesus to you through other people that you're joined to. And, and, and as my first pastor said to me the thing you have to remember Andy is when Jesus comes into your life he brings all his friends with him Amen. just think about that yeah. and just because they're his friends doesn't mean they're automatically your friends but they may be the people that you need to give you life yeah. because there's life in that difference there's life in that 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 uh, that challenge <clears throat> I mean, we've been on, uh, some, I keep being asked how, how I'm doing. Uh, many of you know my dad died sort of uh, early March, and it's been a tough old journey for me, actually. I never expected it to be like this, and uh, I'm taking my time, and, it's ta and it is taking time. Um, and we, Teresa and I have just been talking. It just seems to happen to us that we, we do things in intense Way. So we had four kids in five years. Those of you with more than one child are already like, wow, they're amazing. How do they do that? <laughs> it was grace and an amazing, amazing mom. Um, and then in the last, literally within just over three and a half years, all our parents have died. So it's coming up. In actually next month it's the fourth anniversary of Teresa's dad's death then my mom died then her mom died and then my dad just died and that has created we, we have had to walk a whole lot of difficult vulnerable emotional stuff for Teresa and, and she's got her own story which you will get to hear at some point her dad's death was a massive trigger of, of stuff in her life um, which She's seen some amazing, amazing, wonderful breakthrough, but I've had to walk that walk. And uh, I think this season of, of loss is emotionally demanding. And I think what I'm finding is, for me, my dad going was a big out. And bit by bit, it's coming back. But I, I, I'm not working more than a couple of sessions a week. And 
I'm really, really grateful to the eldership team for looking after me and saying, take the time. It's really actually great. But that's because they're life to me. I've got a joint. And at different points in this whole journey for Teresa and myself, thank God for our joints in the old leadership team or friends that are around us that have inputted us where we've been able to grieve, we've been able to process, we've been able to hurt and keep going because there's been strength coming to us from people who are close enough that we can tell them we're hurting and they can give us support that isn't just, what's the word, trite or superficial because these things just aren't superficial. Um, and and, and I, I'm just wanting to give you a, a bit of an update while saying thank God for the joints that, uh, that I have, that Teresa has and we have as a couple. Thank God for the elders that are like, Andy, you need to rest, you need a break, and we'll take care of everything. Because the thing that drives me, I'm a high responsibility person. So if I don't know what needs to be done is being done, I'm going to get on and do it even if I'm not really up to it. And I've done that in the past and that, that long term isn't good for you. So I'm very grateful for my life joints. And I'm very grateful at another level because the, one of the things I've discovered in mourning is this feeling, my next birthday, which is not that far away, I will be 62. I know I don't look like it. Thank you for saying. And it just you were straight out of the traps with that one, thanks. But the the sense is, and I, I'm an only child, so my mom and my dad have gone. There's just me. This feeling of being an orphan has been immense, and and it kind of came out of nowhere. I know that I know that I'm not. And I know I'm a, a well-loved, cherished son of the father, but I have had orphanly feelings more often than I would really care to count in recent months. And I really thank God for life joints of people who are coming up to me and saying the opposite. Tell, they're telling me the truth. They're telling me the real truth about me, and that helps me not get stuck in a gloomy place about who I am because that is probably an important emotion to process, but a bad place to stay. Does that, does that make sense? You can't let these difficult emotions become our reality. We're meant to process them until we come into a better reality, into his reality. So these joints are really, really important. And, and I, I did some word study on that speaking truth in love. A few years ago, everywhere I went, was saying, what do you think speaking the truth in love means? And pretty much everybody in Christianity goes, well, it's figuring out how to be really loving when you tell some, 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 somebody something really negative. That's a common held view of what speaking the truth in love means. It's like, how do I give an awkward message in the nicest possible way, but still give it to her? It actually isn't what it means. Or let me put it this way, that is a very small piece of what it means. To speak the truth in love is to, here's some, here's some Greek words, are you ready for some Greek word studies? Are oh, you getting it all this morning? You're getting like the whole, here we go, Greek word studies. This, this is a spirit-led confrontation, vital to telling the truth to others so that they can live in God's reality rather than personal illusion. This is spirit-led confrontation, vital to telling the truth to others so that they can live in God's reality rather than personal illusion. So here I am, I'm feeling an orphan. There's, there's, there's emotional and practical reasons why I'm feeling that, but I have people coming up to me and reminding me who I am. I'd put it this way, I'd rather be uncomfortably confronted than live comfortably in illusion. Shall I say that again as well? I'd rather be uncomfortably confronted than live comfortably in illusion. I'm very comfortable about being deluded. No, thank you very much. 
And so this isn't about telling, actually this, what I'm describing is not telling something negative. I'm being told something positive. I'm just feeling something. Do you see what I mean? It's bringing me back to, I am a son. It's bringing me back to, I am loved. It's bringing me back to, I'm in community. It's bringing me back to, I'm not on my own. And you need people around you, spot you, so they know what to deliver, even if it's uncomfortable. Because actually, when you're feeling a big thing, like, some of you are looking at me like, we, we never do that. We're like, but you, it's a big thing. You feel it. It feels like it's real. Yeah. This feels like this is just how it is. And then someone tells you that's not how it is. You're like, rah! Potentially. But actually, that moment is when we need to hear what heaven is saying, what the Holy Spirit is saying through someone who's close enough to know what we, what we really need and not come up with a thousand reasons why they're wrong. <clears throat> huh. and this, this connection, this, 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 it needs a context because we need a spiritual context and I've been in, I've been in a few contexts where you know mates get, to, guys get together, go out for a beer. But actually, the, you don't always get joint to joint going for a beer. You, you, know, you maybe talk about football. Me and Mark get together. We'll talk about cricket. I know it switches off a lot of small people, but all good. All, yeah, all good, all good, all good. But when it comes to, I'm grieving my dad. I want someone who knows me better than what team I support, and we can discuss the top scorers in the Premier League. It takes, it takes to, you have to create environments where healthy spiritual relationships can emerge. And that often cre- requires leadership, because I've been in those sort of gatherings where everybody's kind of chatting away, chatting away, and nobody's quite got the, uh, to say, why don't we pray? Now, I've been in others where it works, and people do, but that's, that's the essence of, gathering a small group is, is it's got a purpose to create healthy relationships that then change the world. So it's not inward looking, it's outward looking. It's not, oh, how can we get all kind of intimate with each other just for the purpose of being intimate. It's so that we can grow and be like Jesus and being like Jesus means the world changes around us. And I was super excited the other day. I heard a rumor that the group out in um, Yoka at uh, thinking of doing some sort of litter pick or something in there. Is, have I got that right? It kind of came to me via via. So, awesome. Isn't that great? They're thinking, they're strong, we're going to go, we're going to find ways of being salt and light in our community. I, I think it'd be great if we could do that, like round the church hub, start to own that street. There was a city center group. Let's make it the cleanest place in Glasgow. Why is it so good here? It's because we're there. Anyway. There's, there's that whole sustaining, creating the context for that to happen. All right, I'm going to skip my bit on church and I'll give you land in four minutes with five keys to successful small groups. Things what I have learned. <laughs> Number one. To be part of a successful small group, show up. <laughs> it's profound, but true. You may be tired, you may be busy, you may know everybody on social media, but social media is an aid to real relationships, not a substitute. I have hundreds of friends on social media, but none of them are much help to me right now. Show up. Yeah, well, I'm tired. Well, I've found small groups a break from the realities of work, family, normal life, and suddenly, in a different context, strength will arise because you're with your life joints. And community requires commitment. There's something going on. I've talked to a few people in that sort of generations coming behind me where people want community but don't like commitment. You can't have one without the other. Community happens because you're committed, because you show up, because you see someone's eyes every week and suddenly you start to trust them, you know their heart, and they become a connection point for you. If you never get past the, 
that, then you won't have true community. The community you yearn for won't happen unless you show up. Right, number two, come to a group to give. Don't focus on what it's doing for you as your primary goal. What are you putting in, not what you're taking out, is the primary goal. And come to give and grow. Come to give and come to grow. Come to pray out public the first time. Come to give your first prophetic word. Come to pray for someone who's ill. Come to, come to do it. Come to do, experiment with all your spiritual gifts with that group of people so that they get healthier and they'll do the same to you and boom. Number three, expect God. He's keener to show up to a small group than you are. Worship. He comes. We, we had crazy fun times a few years ago. It was in the South Side small group. And everybody remembers this night, and everybody who didn't come regrets they weren't there. Because we had a prayer slot in the prayer room with our small group, and God showed up, and the angel of the church showed up in the room so that we could all either see him or feel him. And then the Holy Spirit got set loose and we all got different speaking in tongues. It was the first encounter we had as a church with the angel of the church. That was in our small group. It rocked. (laughs) If you weren't there, sorry, it didn't happen again, did it? Not quite like that. Expect God. Number four, take responsibility like, you know, baby steps level. I'll bring the biscuits next week. Want to go up a little bit? I'll have a crack at DJ hosting the worship. You know, you can do it. You don't have to play an instrument. You can do it from your iPad. Or CDs if you're old school. And number five, see the thing as part of the big thing. You're feeding into that which feeds into the whole and the whole feeds into that, which is why I think Anthony last week talked about out of Acts 2, you know, they, they met in the temple courts and from house to house. The, 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 the ga- that gathering was part of that gathering and that, the, actually the, 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 the house to house thing built the community that couldn't be built in the temple courts. It added momentum and, and, and strength and, and, <clears throat> and building to the whole because they were getting on, they would take, actually they took responsibility and got on with it. It wasn't, in that case, a program rolled out. It was something they did because they were so responding to what was happening in the larger context, the smaller context got galvanized and the whole thing grew. And actually, people were added daily to this this thing. The small is part of the big. The big feeds into the small. Don't get stuck in your little corner, as it were. Amen.